Jean Brigmont, just uh, in March 2017, just did a really published his talk that he gave a few years back. And I'm just quoting the final paragraph of his paper because he did a history of quantum mechanics or he called it the comedy of errors. This a little bit refers to what Gerhard was saying about Bell's statement in 1987. And I read that to you. The lesson of this sad history is that we are unlikely to understand the real issues raised by quantum mechanics, whether they be the role of the observer or non-locality, if we continue to adhere to a history of quantum mechanics written by the victors. And the victors, of course, are to be found on the operationalist side. At least until now, he's saying. And that history that systematically misrepresents the views of Einstein, Schrödinger, de Rilly, Bohm, and Bell, reading those authors without prejudice would already constitute a big step in the right direction. We want to raise some of those issues here to highlight uh, how you can, if you go back to reading those papers in the original way and, and just get inspired by those ideas. So, but you can be forgiving for the operationalists because quantum theory is a mathematical theory which describes and predicts measurement outcomes. And that's it. It's hugely successful. You don't need ontology. You can do everything with that. So it's really a matter of interpretation. But quantum ontology tries to do something else. It seeks to bridge the explanatory gap between theory and describing measurement outcomes. And science has long been about explanation. And the question is, should we give up on explanation when we face quantum phenomena? Or should we go further and be creative and imaginative about new ways of talking about reality? It comes really from an unresolved relationship, this whole problem, between mathematics and reality. This is at the heart of it. We still don't know, after 400 years of modern science, what the connection is between mathematics and reality. Uh, mathematics is a model of precision objectivity. It delivers non-empirically abstract knowledge of non-physical reality, so to speak, as expressed in number, sets, and functions. But we don't know what the exact relationship is of these abstract data to the empirical data of science. In the classical world, we do know there's ontic elements that mathematical functions describe and relate to. In quantum physics, we don't know that. We don't know what that means. So the relationship has remained obscure between these uh, in, in, in quantum. And that's why we have multiple interpretations of quantum mechanics today. At last count, I, I looked up 70, 80, 90 different interpretations of quantum mechanics. I'm just going to talk about four to give you sort of a flavor of, of, of extreme positions. The operationists who would say, there is no quantum reality. There are no elements of reality. We don't, don't need to talk about this. All we need to do is to do mathematics and predict uh, probabilities. The realist, though, the ontic approach, like a Bohmian, tries to do the following. It really tries to connect mathematics and reality, ontic elements, to statements in the theory so that there could be a bridging, a final understanding of what's really going on. And that's the Bohmian position, let's say, with the quantum potential, but many other approaches you know, that we'll find out about during this meeting. So there's three essential papers which really define the discussion on non-locality. You need to read only those three. And I spent many years now with these three papers only. And if you study these, um, it's very clear that there's still a reason to be a possibility to be a realist about quantum mechanics. Start with this one and, non and, and John Bell on this paper which established a firm theorem about non-locality. And when he was interviewed in 1990, he said, you know, was asked, what does it mean to you, non -locality? It really means that what you do here has immediate consequences in remote places. And he was pointing to the peak of Mont Blanc and then to his desk. And he really was a realist about non-locality. There's no doubt about that. Many people don't accept that or don't know that, but he really was. Another persistent myth about Bell is the following, and, and science writers to this day write this. They would say Bell's theorem in 64 has shown that hidden variable theories are incompatible with the predictions of orthodox quantum theory. And it's repeated over and over and over again in papers in 2017 and in, in newspaper articles and science articles. Uh, a hidden variable is any variable describing the quantum state which is not included in the standard description of the wave function psi. The truth is that Bell proved only the incompatibility for local hidden variables. John Bell did not generalize his theorem towards non-local hidden variables. That is exactly the opposite. His theorem proved, if you're a realist, the hidden variables need to be non-local. And also, he, he was not against hidden variables at all. And that's how he's portrayed. In fact, he thought long and hard about it. In 1976, he says, the usual nomenclature, hidden variables, is most unfortunate. 
perhaps uncontrolled variable would have been better for these variables by hypothesis for the time being cannot be manipulated at will by us. So these are variables that are inaccessible to measurements, observable but yet real, uncontrollable by the experimental agent. Of course, that goes against the grain by any scientist. We think science should be exactly about what we can control, what we can know about. So to postulate something that's beyond measurement sounds like nonsense to many people. But we have that all the time in science. You know, when we talk about what's happening beyond the black hole event horizon, when we talk about so on and on and on. I don't need to list the examples. So, but this raises a really important question, I think, which lies at the forefront of ontological approaches to quantum mechanics. What is the ontological status of epistemically inaccessible quantum states? I think that's a key question. I think that the future of quantum mechanics will explore more and more. Uh, because agent dependency and things like that come into play here. Let me just see how, how I'm doing on time, sorry. I have uh, a few more minutes because the alarm goes off, so <laughs> I have to rush this. Uh, <coughs> let's just go here, that's right. And of course, with Einstein and Polosky Rosen paper, it said orthodox quantum theory must be incomplete, because otherwise the world would actually have to be non-local. And of course, Einstein rejected spooky action at a distance, and, and, that's the, and, and he never let go of that idea. You know, he was always a localist about reality. But on one thing, Bohr and Einstein, despite all the disputes and the discussions between Bohr and Einstein, there's one thing they agreed upon. They were unified in their opposition to the idea that real non-local influences might exist in nature. And both argued against intrinsic or objective non-locality, but for very different reasons. Bohr made the epistemological case oh, I'm not talking about reality at all, so there can't be real non-local influences. And of course, uh, Einstein being the realist, he just argued against non-locality as an idea. He was absolutely local, given relativity theory and so on, about what he was thinking. But on that point, ironically, they agreed. And exactly on that point, David Bohm disagreed with both of them in, in his proposal. So he comes along in 1952, and this is why we're here today. You know, how science can be changed by a single... Two papers, in fact, and we're still talking about this today now, uh, and published an alternative approach for accounting for the quantum correlations, these non-local correlations, based on the controversial idea of intrinsic objective non-locality. In 2017, we called this class of theories ontological or scientific theories. And here we are. According to Bohm, is the universe local or non-local? His answer would be, the world is not intrinsically random, but it is, in fact, fundamentally interconnected or non-local. Uh, I'm going to skip here. Just want to make a note. None of the experiments I mentioned before, you know, about 1,200 kilometers apart, have actually disproven determinism or the reality of non-local realism. All the experiments that have been carried out today, and I know people have been saying, no, determinism was disproven, non-local realism was disproven. Yes, it was disproven in certain segments of the theory, but not as a general concept, and I think that has to be highlighted. Uh, curiously, Hansen, you know, when asked what, this, what his experiment meant, he says, we have now confirmed there exists spooky action at a distance. Of course, an operationalist, is this really true? An operationalist would say, no. We have local observations where the information is non-locally correlated. That would be the proper operationalist way of saying it. So I was really surprised that he would say that. Um, and so I'm just going to say a few things about four interpretations. Cubism is on the one extreme, a subjective local interpretation. Uh, and it really says non-locality can't be effect. It's just a poetic notion, which we must deny. Then we have Copenhagen, of course, which doesn't talk about anything underlying reality. There is no quantum world, only abstract description. It's wrong to think that physics should find out how nature is. We should be concerned with nature, what we can say about nature. A Niels Bohr statement. So we have local observations and no non-local influences. In Bohmian mechanics, the, uh, it's more difficult. We have a primitive ontology. The on non-locality is nomological, lawful, but without a firm ontological basis. So the question whether there are non-local influences, yes or no, is open. At least Mike, Michael Esfeld says there is no action distance among anything in Bohmian mechanics. But we have Roderich Tumulke here this morning, and he's going to clear that up for us and let us know what's really going on here. And he's a real expert, and we're glad to have him here and give a talk uh, later this morning. And in Bohmian theory, we've talked about that. There is non-local ontology and realism, but not naive realism. 
And in Bowman Hiley, it was argued, we have not found yet what we could regard as a valid, logical, or scientific reason for dismissing non-locality. And that's, by the way, true to this day, 25 years later. Uh, what is the future of scientific explanation? I'm going to run, skip through that, because I'm running out of time. But certainly, if we want to explain non-locality, we, need, we can't work with old concepts of objective reality or naive realism, which has been sort of a reference point to argue against by the orthodoxy. We need new notions of reality and realism, like reality as a process, which was the Bohmian perspective, Real, relational reality as a possibility, interactive reality, contextual reality, or emergent reality. So all of these are avenues to explore in finding new concepts of realism that might underlie quantum mechanics, if you want to hold on to these discussions. Uh, objections to ontological non-locality are the impossibility of doing science. If everything is connected with everything else, you can set up even experiment. <laughs> of course, with decoherence, you can do that. Quantum events don't happen at the macroscopic level that easily. They really happen at the microscopic level. Uh, you can never prove it. It's a non-falsifiable hypothesis. Maybe, maybe not. We need to see. But maybe weak measurement advances there could provide the way for this. And finally, the incompatibility with special relativity theory. And I'm just going to talk about that briefly. I'm going to skip through these other ones. Uh, because there we need of a new non-signaling theorem, an effective one, not an axiomatic one, to actually deal with this problem. And Gerd and I, we've done a little paper on this last year, which really establishes the agency aspect. It's not that loud. It's, ah, it gets louder. So, finally, conscious agent, why are this concerned with experimental agency and free will? Because we need an agent-dependent interpretation of these theorems to make ontological approaches work. That's the key thing. You always hear about realism and quantum realism not requiring observers. Yes, that's true, because you don't have a collapse of the wave function. So for that part, you don't need an observer state. And that's the advantage of Bohmian mechanics, for example. But in the interpretation of the quantum theory, you definitely need agents and observers. And, um, and we're going to have talks about this throughout this meeting. So this goes to agency. And agency is about control, intent, goal directedness, and measurement choice. And this is what uh, David Bohm was talking about and, and Basil Hailey, that we can't control these states. And that's important. And, and John Bell, hidden variables can't be controlled by agents. And that's why it works. And I want to mention that also on day three, uh, jointly with the Foundational Questions Institute, uh, the Fetzer Frank Fund is going to announce a program to explore exactly agents in the physical world. So I'm glad to have Anthony Aguirre here, and Max Tegmar is going to be here later today to actually announce that program then. And Anthony is going to give details on this program. So on consciousness, finally, there's two levels that can be discussed. One is at the level of quantum experimentation, observer dependency, measurement choice agent-dependent quantum interpretations, the issue of controllability. But we also discuss on the third day of the meeting with consciousness, with quantum theory and quantum effects in understanding the formation of human consciousness and agency itself. And maybe these two levels are connected in a future understanding of those levels. And that's in the afternoon of day three, morning and afternoon of day three. Finally, two minutes. We are here on the occasion to celebrate David Bohm's 100th birthday. And... David Bohm died exactly 25 years ago, tomorrow, 25 years ago. And I promise you, when we set up this conference, uh, and these were the only three days we could get this room, this was nine months ago, and it turned out to be exactly 25 years uh, to the day uh, of his death in 1993. So you might think whatever you want to think about that, but it's, it's, it's a correlation. Whether it's ontic or epistemic, we really don't know. And one thing I also want to mention, David Bohm and John Fetzer, the founder of the Fetzer Institute, and the reason why we actually can all be here, uh, and the, whose vision is guiding the Fetzer Franken Fund, uh, invited David Bohm to be a science scholar in residence at the Fetzer Institute uh, in the early 90s, late 80s and early 90s. And this is one of the rare photos. It's the only photos. And I think I got it from Jeff Tollockson, uh, because no other photo exists. So we're glad we have this one. And it shows them at dinner at the Fetzer Institute. 
and 27 years ago. And I think John Fetzer would be very proud that we have this occasion today to celebrate this centennial event and that we kind of complete the circle, whatever happens in the future. 